<laughs> okay, good. Right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to meeting series in which we're looking at um, some of the books that some of us think are indispensable and should be on every Jewish bookshelf. And um, tonight we're venturing into the world of fiction, largely. Uh, later on, we're going to hear from Priscilla about one of the nine, what about about one of nineteenth-century Anglo Jewry's most famous literary celebrities. Um, Israel Zangwill was a pupil, an ex-pupil teacher, and a teacher at the Jews Free in Bell Lane in the East End, or JFS as it's currently known. Um, he was called the Jewish Charles Dickens. But we'll have to wait for, for to find out more about that for a little while, because first of all, we're off to the shtetl of Eastern Europe to meet Mr. Sholem Eichen and his most famous creation, Tevye the Milchiger, Tevye the Milkman. Now, of course, we're all really, really familiar with Tevye and his various manifestations on screen and on stage and figure on the roof. But um, I think there's perhaps a bit more to Tevye than Topol would have us believe. So, Maurice, it's all over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just bring up this screen share thing. Oops, not that one. There we go. Uh... Maurice, would you like me to help you? Yes, please. <laughs> Oh, fine. Um, Tevye Nochman. Sholem Nachomovich, Nachomovich, Sholem Nachomovich Rabinovich was born in 1859 in Pereslav and grew up in the nearby shtetl of Vorozkiv. In the Poltava government, I shouldn't have taken this subject, it's too many different names here, of the Russian Empire. Now in the Kivye Oblast of central Ukraine. His father, Menachem Nachum Rabinovich, was a rich merchant. However, a failed business affair plunged the family into poverty, and Sholom Rabinovich grew up in reduced circumstances. When he was 13 years old, the family moved back to Peris Yeslev, where his mother, Chaya Esther, died in a cholera epidemic. This was a community that had been in existence since at least the 1600s. Sholem Numovich's first venture into writing was an alphabetic glossary of the epithets used by his stepmother. At the age of 15, inspired by Robinson Crusoe, he composed a Jewish version of the novel. In 1876, after graduating from school in Peri Yaslev, he spent three years tutoring a wealthy landowner's daughter, Olga Hodel Loev. From 1880 to 1883, he served as the Crown Rabbi in Lubyi, a position in the Russian Empire given to a member of the Jewish community appointed to act as an intermediary between his community and the imperial government to perform, to perform certain civil duties, such as registering births, marriages, and divorces. In 1883, by the time he was 24 years old, he already had and would continue to assemble a precocious collection of pseudonyms, including such curiosities as Sholem Birkefesta, Sholem the Book Eater, Baron Pippinote, Baron Ogre, Terak and Anikol, Terak's grandson, and the Yiddish Gazlan, the Jewish the robber Jew. This was the year he published his first Yiddish story, Zwei Steiner, Two Stones, a satirical account of local politics and used for the first time the pseudonym Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Aleichem, a play on his first name and an announcement to the world, here I am. On May the 12th, 1883, against the wishes of her father, Solomon and Olga married. They had their first child named Estina in 1884, Daughter Laia was born in 1887. As Laia Kaufman, she became a Hebrew writer. Laia's daughter, 
Bell Kaufman, uh, was also a writer, was the author, author of Up the Down Staircase, which was also made into a successful film. A third daughter, Emma, oh, what's going on here? Third daughter, Emma, uh, was born in 1888. In 1889, Olga gave birth to a son. They named him Elimelech after Olga's father, but at home, home they called him Misha. Daughter Marusi, who would one day publish a biography of her father under her married name, Marie Waif Goldberg, was born in 1892. A final child, a son named Nochum, Numa, uh, Numa, named after Solomon's father, was born in 1901 under the name Norman Rabin. He became a painter and an influential art teacher. In 1890, Shalom Aleichem was a central figure in Yiddish literature and had produced over 40 volumes in Yiddish. Apart from his own literary output, Shalom Aleichem used his personal fortune to encourage other Yiddish writers. In 1888-89, he put out two issues of an almanac, the Yiddish Volksbibliothek, the Yiddish Popular Library, which gave expo exposure to young Yiddish writers. A few years after Sholem and Olga married, they inherited Olga's father's estate. But in 1890, Sholem Novovich lost their entire fortune in stock speculation and fled from his creditors. As a result, he could not afford to print the Almanac's third issue, which had been edited, but was subsequently never printed. After witnessing the pogroms that swept through southern Russia in 1905, including uh, Kivi, Solomon Nachman left Kiev and, wrote, and emigrated to New York City, where he arrived in 1906. His family set up house in Geneva, Switzerland. But when he saw he could not afford to maintain two households, he joined them in Geneva. Although his writings were popular, he was forced to take up an exhausting schedule of lectures in order to make ends meet. In July 1908, during a reading, of, reading tour of Russia, Sholom Novovich collapsed on a train going through Baranovich. He was diagnosed, he was diagnosed with a relapse of acute hemorrhagic tuberculosis and spent two months convalescing in the town's hospital. He later described the incident as meeting his majesty, the angel of death, face to face, and claimed it as a catalyst for writing his biography, Fulham Yarid, from the fair. As a result of his illness, he missed the first conference of the Yiddish, of the Yiddish language, held in 1908 in Shaznovich. His colleague and fellow Yiddish activist, Nathan Bernburn, went in his place. Solomon Novich spent the next four years living as a semi-invalid. During this, this period, the family was largely supported by donations from friends and admirers, including his fellow, fellow Yiddish authors, Ayo Perez, Jacob Denison, Mordechai Spector, and Noach Pai Tuki. In 1909, in celebration of his 25th jubilee as a writer, his friends and colleague, Jacob Denison, spearheaded a committee with Dr. Gershon Levine, Abraham Podolevsky, and Noach Prayoki to buy back the publishing rights to Solomon Achim's works from various publishers for his sole use in order to provide him with a steady income. At the time, Solomon Numovich was ill and struggling financially. This proved to be an invaluable gift, and he expressed his gratitude in a thank you letter in which he wrote, if I try to tell you 100th part of the way I feel about you, I know that there would be sheer profanation. I'm fated to live, if I'm fated to live a few years longer than I had been expecting, I shall doubtless be able to say it's your fault. Yours and that of all the other friends who have done so much to carry out your idea of the redemption of the imprisoned. Sholom Novovich moved to New York City with, again with his family in 1914. The family lived in Lower East Side, Manhattan. His son, Misha, ill with tuberculosis, was not permitted to end entry to the United States um, under their immigration laws and remained in, in Switzerland with his sister Emma. By virtue of the three petitions of Poland in 1772, 1793, and 1795, 
and the revisions of them made by the Congress of Vienna in 1815, the Russian state, which had traditionally barred Jews entirely, suddenly acquired large numbers of them without any desire so to do. Overnight, as it were, the Jewish communities of Eastern and Central Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Belarusia, and Ukraine found themselves on annexed Russian soil, beyond whose boundaries, however, the Tsarist regime in St. Petersburg had no intention of letting them spread. And so by the end of the 18th century, it came into being the human enclosure of the Pale of Settlement. That vast ghetto of Western and Southwest Russia to which millions of, millions of Jews were confined. The Pale of Settlement as an, as an entity was never clearly defined. Its exact borders kept shifting as different parts of it were de declared in or out of bounds according to the whims of bureaucrats. The outer pressure of the Jews bottled up inside and the counter pressure of anti-Jewish officials and Russian merchants fearing Jewish competition. Thus, for instance, the Ukrainian capital of Kiev, the Yehudspet of Shalom Aleichem's fiction, in a city in which he lived for many years, was first opened to the Jews in 1794, then barred to them in 1835, then put back on limits for temporary visits only in 1862, then gradually reopened to Jewish residents by special permit, which depended on the petitioner's profession and connections he happened to have. Even more fulfilled with re filled with re reversals was the history of Jewish residence rights in the Pale's rural villages. Originally left to the discretion of the nobility, in, 19, in 1797, rural residents were, residents for Jews were denied. In 1804, this was temporarily restored. In 1807, re-denied again. 1808, restored again. 1823, partially revoked once more, and so back and forth until 1910, when the final raid of royal expulsions began. Jews were excluded from local councils and trade guilds. They were made to pay special and frequently humiliating taxes. A head tax, a property tax, tax, tax on the slaughter of kosher meat, the tax on Shabbos candles, the tax on the right to wear their traditional clothes. They were barred at different times and places from a wide range of occupations, law, agriculture, tavern keeping, the production and sale of liquor, the retailing of manufactured articles, the employment of their wives as market vendors. They were harassed in, it, in the education of their children, forced to send them to Russianizing schools, and then confronting, confronted with a system of quotas that made the Russian schooling almost impossible. They were subjected to especially harsh, harsh draft laws, being inducted into the army in higher percentages and for longer terms of service than any other sectors of the population. An idea of the cynical cruelty in which this tool was wielded can be gained from a sample of the rash of anti-Semitic decrees and outbreaks that followed in the next several years. In 1881, government incited riots in Yevestograd, Kiev, and elsewhere in Ukraine, as well as in Warsaw. The government official blamed them on Jewish economic exploitation of the masses, which had been driven to accept their just revenge. 1882, the Jews were again forbidden to settle in any of the rural sections of the Pale of Settlement, that is 90% of its area, or to buy property there. Jews already living in the villages are made subject to expulsions if they do not own their own homes. If they move from village to village, or if they are absent from the village, they live in for more than a few days. 1883, pogroms in Rostov-on-Don, Thousands of Jews living illegally in, in St. Petersburg are rounded up by the police and expelled. 1884, Progrom in Nizhny Novgorod. 1887, all high schools and universities within the Pale of Settlement, where Jews, though, through, though roughly 10%, uh, roughly 10 of the inhabitants, form a majority of the literate population, are limited to a Jewish quota of 10% of their student bodies. 1890, numerous towns in the Pale are reclassified as villages from which Jews are therefore expelled. Jews are disqualified 
throughout the Pale of Settlement were voting for deputies in local election. 1891, 20,000 Jews are expelled from Moscow. 1894, Jews are forbidden to change their names to not the Jewish ones. Jewish identity passes are marked with the word Jew. 1899 to 1900, more pogroms in Ukraine. In Vilna, a Jew is put on trial for the on the atavistic charge of attempting to murder a Christian girl in order to bake Passover matzo from her blood. This medieval blood libel was to be repeated in 1911 in the more famous case of Mendel Bielis, which attracted worldwide attention. 1903, worst pro pogrom yet in Kishinev. 45 Jews killed, 86 severely wounded, 1,500 Jewish homes and stores looted and demolished. Program in Hamel, where Jews try for the first time to defend themselves with arms. 36 are indicted for attacking Christians. 1904, outbreak of the Russo Japanese War. Jews are pulled up in disproportionate numbers. The numbers of Jewish soldiers sent to the front is also disproportionately large. Even the popular backed revolution of 1905, which broke out after the af aftermath of Russia's defeat by Japan, and led Nicholas II to grant a short lived constitution, a short lived liberal constitution that aroused, other, amongst other things, extravagant hopes of new age for Russians' Jews, only ended in the further shedding of Jewish blood. The ink on the constitutional manifesto was hardly dried, and gangs of counter revolutionary thugs, known as the Black Hundreds, organized with the complicity of the Tsarist police, attacked Jewish neighborhoods all over Russia. Soon after witnessing the Kiev pogrom, all the refugees from the, fa uh, from the refuge of his family hotel room, Sean Alekhan left Russia, returning for only brief visits. It's estimated that between 1881 and 1914, where World War I shut the gates to immigration, nearly three million Jews left the Russian empire, mostly for the United States. Russia again began to displace Yiddish in daily speech, and it's an outstanding symptom of the times that Shalom Aleichem spoke, himself spoke Russian to his wife and children. At that time, the medieval, medieval culture of Orthodox Judaism that had remained intact for centuries was in the process of crumbling. Everywhere, battered from without and eroded from within, Jewish life was in a state of flux, disarray, and decomposition. It is against this background that Tevye de Milka emerges. Tevye de Milka, Tevye the Dairyman, arguably the greatest of all Yiddish novels, comprises a series of eight episodes written, written over and covering a period of 20 years. The first episode was published in 1894 in the Warsaw yearbook, The Heusenfront. Over this 20 year period, Tevye ages at the same rate as Shalom Aleichem. So Tevye ages in real time. A one-act play was created from the series and performed posthumously in 1917. We all have the genes of the shtetl in us, and Tevye is the arch-typical ancestor. His problems are our predecessors' problems, and possibly ours as well. He lives in a hugely changing world and is supremely ill-prepared or equipped to cope with it yet he has to, make, uh, has to attempt to make sense of it. Tevye does this through the use of humour and with, with his continuing dialogue with Hashem, with whom he has a close, personal and continuing relationship. Tevye de Milcha works on many levels. On the one hand, it's a folk story. On another, it's a chronicle of the change of the Jewish ways of life. On yet another, highlights the history of the Jews in the Pale of Settlement. But on the other hand, more later, Tevye de Milcha gives us a detailed account of life in the shtetl, albeit with a light hand. He uses humour to make light of the problems and conditions of life. But this is not a self-deprecating humour, but rather it's used as a lens to highlight and examine his environment. His humour and great optimism are held up as a beacon. 50 years ago, saw the production of a stage show and then a movie, Fiddler on the Roof. The dramatic plot, The Fiddler on the Roof, is culled from just four of the eight Tevye episodes. 
third, fourth, fifth, and eighth. In Fiddler, Servia has five daughters. Tony Tsaitsel, Hoddle, and Hara are, are central to the script. On the other hand, how many daughters he has is a question we'll come to in a moment. The first episode, Tevia Strikes at Rich, was which was based on an actual milkman whom Sholmalaka befriended one summer in the resort town of Boyaka near Kiev, the Bobby Bob Berwick of his no novel. It was no doubt written as an independent story with little thought given to, to a sequel. Its figure of seven na nameless daughters being no more of a way of saying many. Also probably meant to stand by itself was the second episode, Tevia Blows a Small Fortune, in which Tevia meets, meets Menachem Mendel, who was already the comic hero of another epistolary work of fiction that Shalom Aleichem was working on at the time. In this, along with episode three, Today's Children, which is about Seitzel, Te Tevia's oldest daughter, both published in 1899, no count is given at all. By the fourth episode, on the other hand, Sholem and Eichen have evidently decided to write a series about Tevye's daughters, which meant producing seven more stories, one for each of them. Thus in, <coughs> thus in Hoddle, episode four, and Chava, episode five, we again read of seven girls. Yet in episode six, Sprints, either tiring of the subject, or feeling he was running out of material, he reduced their number to six, the two youngest of whom are Belika and Tibial. However, in episode seven, episode seven and eight, he cut it again to five. Tibial has vanished and only uh, Belika remains. Episode seven, in fact, was evidently intended to conclude uh, Tibial's cycle with Tibial's departure for Palestine. With Sholem Aleichem's authorization, it was printed in 1911, together with the first six books, episodes, as a book called Tevye the Dairyman, the first time such a title was used for the series as a whole. The eighth and last episode, added several years later, was apparently written as an afterthought, being the desire to return Javier to the bosom of her family. Having written it, however, Sholem Aleichem must have planned at least one further instalment because he did not give this story a coda-like ending as he did in episode seven, and only subsequently sought to make up for the submission by adding a brief fragment that was published shortly, shortly before his death. Shalom Aleichem's humor demanded of its readers that they take life seriously. Indeed, with pogroms and hunger often at the door, they were in no position not to. His comedy did not lift them above the suffering world they were part of, it lifted them together with it. Laughter his work involved was not an out of contempt or embarrassment or of relief or even sympathy, but rather of identification and acceptance. Sholem Aleichem weaponized humor. He produced a weapon that could lead the user into trouble, but was undefeatable. You have, who have been through all of this and who know so much are our, of our lives, that no amount of self-delusion can make them less so. You who have experienced fear and humiliation and desire and defeat and are aware there is yet more to come, you to whom all this has happened and to who, who still have been able to laugh, you, my friends, need no consolation because you've already prevailed. There is scant resemblance between Sholem Lechem's novel and the musical based on it. Indeed, this is true even of the musical's name, which does not come from the work of Sholem Aleichem at all, but from the art of Mark Hagal. Oh, bear with me. The fiddler that painted in 1912, painted in Paris, depicts it sad gay Jewish fiddler playing on the rooftops of a Russian village against the background of a town resembling Hagal's childhood shtetl of Vitbesk. It recalls Hagal's life in Russia, integrating both Christian and Jewish elements and practices. The fiddler hunts, hints at Hagal's upbringing amongst the Hasidim 
used music and dance to bring a community together and inspired religious devotion. Fiddler on the Roof, musical and cinematic adaption, Shalom Aleichem's Teddy of the Dairyman borrowed their names from the, from the painting. Shalom Aleichem's narratives were notable for the naturalness of his characters, speech and accuracy of the description of state of life. Early critics found on the cheerfulness of his focused on the cheerfulness of his characters, interpreting as a way of coping with adversity. Later critics saw a tragic side in his writing. He was often referred to as the Jewish Mark Twain because of the two authors' similarity, similar writing styles, and use of pen names. Both authors wrote for adults and children and lectured extensively in Europe and the United States. When Twain heard of the writer called the Jewish Mark Twain, he replied, please tell him that I'm the American Sholem Aleichem. Sholem Numbovich died in New York in 1916. He was buried in the main section of the Mount Carmel Cemetery in Queens, New York City. Sholem Aleichem had a mortal fear of the number 13. His manuscripts never had a page 13. The number of the 13 pages of his manuscript is 12a. Even his headstone carries the date of his death as May 12A, 1916. His headstone, the, on the, his headstone reads dates of his birth and death in Hebrew as the 26th of Adar and the 10th of Er, respectively. Such was the name of Sholem Aleichem, who had once been Sholem Rabinovich. Sholem Rabinovich is now Sholem Aleichem. Thank you. Can't Thank you, Morris. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any contributions to make or questions to ask. You could oh, use the, the hand up. I saw the chat. I can't see any hands. Let me just flick around. Hello. I can't see any hands. Oh yes, um, here's just, one. Yes, Eva has. Eva has. Eva. Eva has. Has, she? has. Okay, we'll yeah. take Eva and we'll take Joy. Unmute yourself, Eva. Uh, Eva, you have to mute yourself. Yeah. Um, did you have a difficult time in, um, in New York? Um, um, not from what I can gather. He, uh, he was well respected in New York um, and was, was well known in New York. The, every year in New York, on the anniversary of his death, there was actually a Shalom Aleichem festival and probably upwards of 100,000 people go to visit his grave. So um, mm -hmm. there you go. So yes, um, he that, was that popular and um, was aware uh, of that. Did he live in New York? Roughly how many years did he live in New York? I'm just wondering, a big part of his life? Uh, no, um, he went to New York um, in about 1904, I think it was, and died. Mm -hmm. He was there for about eight years. Yeah. But um, I think at the time he was there, he was part of a very great Yiddish writing circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Good. And now over to Joy. Yeah, I just wanted to query, did anyone else have difficulty hearing? Because um, yeah. it kept going off and I've missed so much of it, I'm afraid. I can do a repeat later. <laughs> oh, we thought it was our internet, okay. Oh, no. God. I had a problem hearing, actually. It'll be on, um, be on YouTube also, later, and hopefully the sound will be there because it's recording straight on my machine here. Um, okay, well, that's something because we've also had some problems hearing, so I'm pleased. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, please hear, so is everybody else. Uh, yeah, Howard phoned um, me. Um, Not the okay. old one. Okay. <laughs> and we'll. We'll go to we'll go to the we'll go to the recording. Um, okay. Other than complaints about the audience, else, um, anybody like to make any contributions? Well, I just I thought it was a brilliantly researched uh, talk. I thought it was tremendously interesting. There's a there's a lot of enthusiasm about Shalom Aleichem in, in Israel, as you all know, and uh, there's uh, lots of streets called after him, mm -hmm. Shalom Aleichem. 
I thought Morris did a, a, a terrific job and, and I, was, I just wanted to ask him, how did he research the talk? Um, where, where did he get the information from? <laughs> oh, that, that, that's a nasty question to ask. Um, well. <laughs> that's typical of you. Um, where did I research? I researched it everywhere um, um, on the internet and uh, um, everywhere I could find details of it. I've um, uh, got a stack of papers uh, with, uh, with details and notes on it and um, a couple of books there. So there we go. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, very in Pleasure. thank you. And thank you also on Morris's behalf for, for, for the comment. Thank you, Sean. Actually, it was very remiss of me, actually, I, because we have, a number of, uh, we have a number of visitors to Kenton this evening. And it was a bit remiss of me. I should have uh, welcomed you all maybe half an hour. So forgive me. You're still very welcome, even half an hour later. And um, it's we're very we're delighted to welcome visitors from 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 Israel, from from Edgware, I know, and from elsewhere, no doubt, um, to to our uh, our humble little gathering here tonight. Thank you. Um, you're you're very welcome. It's interesting. I just as, as a final, may not a final thing, but. Um, uh, I remember reading the the the, 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 the Tevya story sequence a while ago, and um, you know Tevya emerges as a, as a much more much, much I don't know get my words correctly I don't give the wrong impression a much less homely sort of a person than you're led to believe on the screen. He's actually got quite an unpleasant side to him, um, which, which of course we don't see too much the roof where he's busy if I've got, I've got a rich man and a chaim and all this business because you know the because of the plot but he's he's actually got an edge to him and a side to him which isn't at all welcome isn't at all pleasant Morris yeah I, I, just one, one shy asked about the research and one of the problems I had in researching it was the the breadth and depth of the books and the character um knowing where to where to draw the lines uh, really, um, there's so much more that could have been said, but limited in time, um, both in, in providing the talk and uh, in delivering it. Um, you know, maybe, maybe a Tevye part two um, in six months' time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll look forward to that, Morris. Okay, uh, well, not every great Jew came from Eastern Europe, or uh, you know, quite a few famous Jews came from the home counties. And one of them is uh, Israel's own world, isn't it, Priscilla? So um, over to you. Um, have I got the ability to share screen, um, Morris? Just one moment, and uh, you will. Just a minute. And I also apologise. My internet is not stable, so I think I'm going to cut out um, to some extent quite often so I apologize in advance um, and if it becomes too unbearable David stop me okay you can uh, share screen now Priscilla okay fine okay all right so we've now moved from Russia to the east end uh, Isra Zangwill 1864-1926 novelist short story writer playwright poet and orator He's known as the Jewish Dickens and regards himself, uh, regarded himself as a Cockney Jew. He was born in Ebenezer Street in the East End and was the second of five children. His father Moses came from Latvia and his mother from Poland. At the age of eight, he went to JFS, as David has previously told us, was a very talented pupil, eventually becoming a teacher at the school, where in fact now a house is named after him. He went to London University in 1884 and attained a BA with first class honours. He married Edith Ayrton in 1903 and they had two sons. From 1906, they lived in East Preston in West Sussex. And I'm just going to show you a picture of married of, of Israel Zangwill with his wife. Uh, uh, hang on. I've got to make it bigger for you because you can't see it. Hang on. Oh, well, I can't. I used to be able to know how to zoom in on it. Oh, hang on. 
No. All right. It's it's quite small. I uh, apologise. Uh, where you see the on the left of the uh, Priscilla, I made it bigger. Where, where, where the cross is? Um, no, on the left hand side. Of the, okay, the fine. No, Priscilla, no, you can make it bigger cross. yourself. I've I've already done it. Okay, has there, can everybody see it? Yeah. Yes. Last time you went yeah. up magnifying glass. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. No. It's Sorry. Right. Okay. Oops. Okay. Right. So that's that was husband and wife. Actually, many of us have read some of uh, Israel Zangwill's work. His talents as a poet were utilized by Routledge in 1905, and it is his translations of Adan Alom, Anim Zemirot, Yigdal, and other prayers that are in fact used in the Routledge Machsa. He wasn't a religious man, but had an intimate knowledge of liturgy and cared deeply about Jewish culture, emancipation, survival, and was an ardent Zionist. His first book published in 1891 was The Bachelors Club, also called The Celibates Club and The Old Maids Club. In the introduction, he says, they are able to live more cheaply together than apart, which is perhaps some excuse for their union, doubling the profits and halving the losses till doth, death doth them part, or more probably consign them to common oblivion. Not a very happy or, optimi or optimistic approach to it, about interpersonal relationships. His other books include The Big Bow Mystery, published in 1892, which was the first of the locked room mysteries and was in fact made into a film in 1946 by Don, produced by Don Siegel called The Verdict. The King of Schnorrers was published in 1894, a social satire and was in fact performed more re most recently in 1979. A lot of his books have very attractive sketches, some by one of his sons. His book and play The Melting Pot, about which I knew nothing before I started my research, was published in 1908 and is dedicated to President Theodore Roosevelt, on whom the play had a great influence when it was first produced in Washington. It was Zangwill who coined this phrase to describe different groupings forming a new mutual identity. I'll share screen again just to give you a book cover. They are. That's is that the right size? Can someone yeah. make it the right yeah. size? Fabulous. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. That's a, that's a book a book cover of the melting pot. It mm -hmm. tells the story of David, a Russian violinist who emigrates to the U.S. after the Kishinev pogrom in Russia in 1904. He writes a symphony, falls in love with a Christian lady whose father he later discovers has murdered his family in Russia, but all's well at the end. The symphony is a success. The Russian confesses his guilt and David marries his love. Some of the sayings coming out of this novel, America is God's crucible, the great melting pot where all the races of Europe are melting and reforming. These phrases, this phrase has been used by a number of American presidents. Another one, which I think is very apposite, the past, our cradle, not our prison. There is danger as well as appeal in its glamour. The past is for inspiration not imitation, for continuation, not repetition. Hmm, good. The ghetto says, very apposites. Um, I'm just going, can someone take this away? <laughs> I've forgotten how to do this. Red button, stop share. Stop shares, thank you, Karen, thank you. Um, the ghetto series comprises the children of the ghetto, a study of a peculiar people published in 1892 together with Grandchildren of the Ghetto. Dreamers of the Ghetto, take, published in 1898, contains stories of those Jewish personalities who have emerged from various ghettos around the world, having influenced not only their own community or ghetto, but the world beyond the ghetto. There are two stories about Venice, being the first place to have a ghetto, and the, and the, and the last story as well. There's a, there is a story about Smyrna, Shabbatai Svi, the false messiah, about Amsterdam, the philosopher uh, and the philosopher Spinoza, all originating from the same environment, the ghetto. The introduction ends with a very poignant statement. For this book is the story of a dream, a dream that has not come true. Is the dream Zion or emancipation? Further books followed, Ghetto Tragedies in 1899, and Ghetto Comedies in 1907. The Melting Pot and Children of the Ghetto 
are the most, fam uh, most famous of Zangwill's novels. And I'm going to concentrate on Children of the Ghetto. This was translated into 20 languages, was a play on Broadway in 1899 and was filmed in 1915. In the 1925 edition that I have, the book is dedicated to US Judge Salzberger as an example of a modern Jew of universal learning and humor, honor and wisdom, a man of the world, a lover of mankind and tireless worker for his own race, truly a judge in Israel. The central character of Children of the Ghetto is Esther Ansell, who lives in the ghetto, who lives in the East End of London in the 1880s and 90s, the environment into which Zangwill was born. For some, it is an existence of, of poverty and continuous struggle. Bearing in mind the Anglo-Jewish community of today, it is hard to imagine the conditions in the East End, in the area around Whitechapel, Wentworth Street, Galston Street and Petticoat Lane. Zangwill has a very sharp eye for the quirks and idiosyncrasies of Jewish communal life, synagogue life and family life, and never ceases to take the opportunity to let us know all about them. The anxieties of Jewish family life haven't changed. Mothers want their daughters to make good marriages, but the intended must have some resources. There are disagreements with the rabbis, and many are not enamored of the current then chief rabbi. No names are given, but it's easy to find out who they're talking about and who Zangwill is talking about. And of course, having come from Russia and Poland, as we have Morris has so well told us, eloquently told us about, there is a talk of the cruel night of Jewry, which coincides with the Christian era, but at least they don't have to live in fear of pogroms. There is discussion about mixed choirs, even then, English and not Yiddish being taught in school and even reformed Judaism. Life in the ghetto is described through the prism of the Jewish year. Pesach, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot and Purim. The poorest of the poor changed their utensils and cleaned their homes for Pesach. Basic food supplies were distributed and fish purchased in the lane before Yontif. One fishmonger, so exasperated by a customer trying to reduce the price, that he smacked around the face with a place. Can you imagine that in that, Jacobs? The Ansel family live in a two-room garret. Esther Ansel, at the age of eight, is mother to her four younger siblings. Her older brother, Benjamin, is a bright boy who has been sent to an orphan boarding school who, and eventually wants to be a writer, like Dickens, to write stories about the people he meets by walking through the streets, just as Zangwill did. However, the family left behind in the garret are hungry and cold. Mother has died giving birth to the youngest sibling and father can't find work. If only he was given the, the opportunity to start a great business, but he was good at being bad as a glazer, cobbler, bookbinder, and many other manual jobs. However, Moses Ansel knew his Talmud and went to shawl three times a day, and his son Solomon could read Rashi. To cap it all, he, had, he has brought his mother from Poland to live with him. She's bedridden and has to share her bed with Esther. Zangwill's father's name was, was Moses and was also a peddler. He hasn't looked very far for his characters. Esther sells new shoes given to her by school in order to buy food for the family. There are additional benefits if you learn English at school. Food in the main comes from the local soup kitchen and poor Esther in her hurry to bring soup home to her brothers and sisters slips and spills the soup. They had only had dried bread for breakfast. The, si the soup drips through the floorboards to the flat below where there is a celebration going on. Soup and bread from the party are taken upstairs to feed Esther and her family. Hesed in the ghetto, despite their circumstances. Esther is a reader, but there's no money for books. She reads the New Testament given to her by a missionary because it's the only reading matter she can lay her hands on until she goes down to the second floor to visit Dutch Debbie, who reads the London Journal, which is full of romantic stories of knights and fair ladies. At a pigeon a Ben, we hear about fried fish. Fried fish binds Anglo jewelry more than all the professions of unity. Its savor is early known of youth and the divine flavor draws back the sinner into the paths of piety. Fried fish reigns, oh, sorry, reigns above all in cold unquestioned sovereignty. If your fiance's mother can't fry fish, then he or she isn't suitable. I never knew the ability to fry fish well was a benchmark of eligibility. 
Cousin Malka's daughter, Leah, is engaged to Sam Levine. To tease her and to practice his wedding vows, he repeats them to Hannah, daughter of Reb Shmuel. As we know, and as Reb Hyams informs him, he's married Hannah. Sam scoffs, but a divorce has to be arranged before his wedding to Leah, with disastrous consequences for Hannah. We meet Pinchas Melchizedek, an eccentric but very learned poet, writer, playwright, newspaper editor, whatever he fancies at any given moment. Is this in fact a caricature of Zangwill himself? He was all these. Pinchas will turn his hand to anything, if only the world around him would recognize his genius. But the world did acknowledge Zangwill's genius. We meet Shossi Schmendrick, who's fallen in love with Belle, but is spurned as she's in love with someone else. Reb Hyam's daughter Miriam is a teacher in a local school, but has no sympathy with the restrictions of Jewish life in the ghetto. She is waiting for a husband who will realize her worth and take her away. Hannah, the daughter of Reb Shmuel, has no wish to get married, despite her mother having nagged her since she was 17. Hannah and Miriam represent the emerging desire of women to run their own lives, to be independent. Aunt Zangwill was a great supporter of women's suffrage. When Hannah falls in love at the Purim Ball, she's unable to marry David, newly returned from South Africa, as he is a Cohen and she is a divorced woman, despite, as we know, Sam not having been serious. However, she plans to elope. The plan is to elope and escape as she opens the door for Elijah during the Seder, but she can't. The power of the ghetto and her family ties are too strong. She has forsaken her love and her future. She never marries. So much happens at pace of time, the time of our freedom, that I wonder if Zangwill is using this as a meta metaphor for the path away from the ghetto and Jewish life that occurred as the immigrants became established and their children educated. He acknowledges the influence of the world beyond the ghetto, Zionism, university, Jews college, literature, George Eliot, who is mentioned a number of times, Byron, Dante, Spinoza, and the contrast between life in the East End and life in the West End of those Jews who have achieved success and are still observant. Zangwill, having illustrated the oh, excuse me, having illustrated the poverty of life in the East End, now moves to the second part of the story, the grandchildren of the ghetto. We move forward 10 years to the West End, to the affluent and emancipated Jewish families. Esther is now living with the Goldsmith family, a wealthy established family who have adopted her, though not legally, having no children of their own. Mrs. Goldsmith has arranged for Esther's father and siblings to go to Chicago, where there is greater opportunity. Esther comes to the Goldsmith atten attention, having won a writing prize. They take responsibility for her education and her lifestyle, is that of a well-to-do young lady of London society, even having been to London University. Zangwill has been quite cheeky. The Goldsmith family, Goldsmith family, were one of the established, respected and influential Jewish families in London at the time. Isaac Lyon Goldsmith was heavily involved in the creation of London University, which Zangwill attended. The Goldsmiths of the novel were observant, but would have relaxed their observant, were it not for, observance, were it not, were it not for their Irish Catholic housekeeper, Mary O'Reilly, who made sure Shabbat and Yontav, to the extent of Badik at Hamets before Pesach, and Kashra were observed as they had been by the family in previous generations. We meet Montague, the name of another well-established Jewish family of the time, and Pisa Samuels, otherwise known as Percy Saville, Sidney Abrahams, also known as Sidney Graham, a successful artist, and brother and sister, Addie and Raphael. They are irate, irate and angry at the way they have been portrayed in a novel recently published called Mordechai Josephs by one Edwin Armitage, which describes the affluent Jewish community as hypocritical and insincere. This highly respected Jewish community do the right thing, go to the right places and send their children to the right schools. Why have they been written about in such a way? It's obvious the author has inside knowledge, but nobody knows who has written about them and the, com and the community in such a derisory and familiar manner. Those of you who have read Dickens may be able to guess the author. George Eliot and Daniel Deronda are mentioned again as having greater respect for the Jewish community than this Edwin Armitage. George Eliot was the nom de plume of Mary Ann Evans, her last and most brilliant novel, some say, called Daniel Deronda, published in 1876. 
The title character discovers he is Jewish after a Gentile upper-class childhood, accepts and decides to maintain his new identity. It was a sympathetic portrayal of Jewish spiritual and moral ideas and sense of community. And this was quite an unusual theme for a Victorian novel, but illustrates the emerging emancipation of the Jewish community in England at the time, bearing in mind the first Jewish MP, Sir Lionel de Rothschild, took his seat in the House of Commons in 1858. The Raphael of the Children of the Ghetto is the brilliant Oxford graduate, who to Esther's amazement and admiration has sustained his orthodoxy through university. Esther doesn't hesitate to let Raphael know she's not the goldsmith's daughter. She relates to him her story of how she became the breadwinner at the age of eight and had to work as a teacher at the age of 13 and was the sole breadwinner. She tells Raphael she achieved more religious inspiration from the New Testament. Remember the book she was given by the missionary, which was her reading material. Raphael sees worth in any religious inspiration. She feels Judaism is more a religion of pots and pans than intellectual stimulation. Raphael believes that Jews have taught the world religion as well as Greece has taught the world beauty and science. The Reverend Joseph Strelitsky, born and educated, read yeshiva in Russia, and now rabbi of the Kensington Synagogue, has also come from the ghetto where he sold cigars to earn a living. Had he stayed in Russia, he would have been a very active revolutionary. In London, he extols his community to spirituality rather than mundane communal matters. After a night at the theatre with her friends, Esther is confronted by the son of the rabbi of the ghetto, Levi, now known as Leonard James, whose ambition is to be an actor. He declares his love for Esther, but his feelings aren't returned. He has assumed because he, of their mutual past in the ghetto that they would have a relationship. After her dismissal of him, he accuses Esther of being a schnorrer, the daughter of a schnorrer. She is living on the charity of others and she has forgotten her origins. She is profoundly shocked and shaken. She is not part of the community of the West End and she has shunned all those she grew up with. She tells Raphael she is going away. She can no longer live on the generosity of her benefactors. She wants to go away, to be able to, to be independent, to be able to express herself without restriction. She admits she is the author of the Mordecai Joseph, having used her initials, Edwin Armitage, which was a device used by Dickens. She regards herself as being cast out. Like Spinoza, the Dutch philosopher, excommunicated from his leaves the goldsmiths with nothing but a little money and a few personal items, walks back to the ghetto and, and her first night is spent with Dutch Debbie, sharing her bed in the room below above but below the garret of her childhood. She revisits the family she knew as her child, as a child. Cousin Malka can't understand that Esther has left the West End and bitterly accuses her of coming to Schnorrer from her own family. Esther tells her she wishes to earn her own living and will certainly not be asking for help from her. She visits her publishers and is astonished to find that her book has been quite successful. She is now solvent. She can go to America to, to visit her family. She doesn't want Raphael to know where she is because she does not want him to influence her to change her mind. In what I call a tennis match of ideas in the second chapter from the end of the book entitled From Soul to Soul, I think this chapter exposes Zangwill's Zangwil soul, his ideas, thoughts and frustrations about his own Judaism and the Judaism of the time. I'm going to quote of some of them because I still, I think some of them resonate today. Stagnation is death, says Strelitsky. You are respected and revered, says Raphael. Strelitsky's skepticism is better than stagnation. Orthodoxy is entangled with the ritual observance and ceremonial religion is of the ancient world, not the modern. Raphael, but our ritual is sublime and it's discipline to be admired. Ceremony is a casket of religion. More often it's coffin, says Strelitsky. Raphael, Judaism is so human, no abstract meta metaphysics, but a lovable way of living the common life sanctified by centuries. The world is wide and we are so narrow. I want the atmosphere of ideas and ideals. I shall go to America. There Judaism is grander, larger and nobler. There is room for all parties. Freedom of thought is not repressed into hypocrisy. Raphael, 
We are already ob object lessons in good fellowship, charity, respect for learning. Our social system is the bequest from the ancient world from which the modern may yet benefit. Palestine is part of our future. A fatherland focuses a people. Without it, we are but the gypsies of religion. We must not give up the dream. All over the world, at every prayer, every Jew turns towards Jerusalem. Today's task is to make its citizens by blood worthier of their privilege. Strelitsky, may we not dream nobler dreams than political independence, which is only the means to an end? To be merely one among the nations is not so satisfactory an ideal. It is not a spiritual ideal. If the nations cast us out, we could draw together and form a nation. To be a nation without a Hebrew, there is the spiritual originality, the miracle of history. The brotherhood of Israel will be the nucleus of the brotherhood of man. Zhang Wu was very involved with early Zionism and was a friend of Theodore Herzl. I'd now like to show you another picture. Oh, that one's disappeared. <laughs> oh, it was a very, oh, what a shame. Um, no, okay. No, the picture that has disappeared from my screen was a picture of um, Zhang Will at a memorial service for Herzl. Um, Zhang Will attended the early meetings of the Zionist Congress, where even though he was not a delegate, Herzl allowed him to speak. When a genius is present, we must allow him to speak. Zhang Will broke away to form the Jewish Territorial Organization in 1905, which advocated the possibility of a Jewish state wherever there was land available famously in Uganda. However, this strained his relations with Weizmann. Um, and it's a, in fact, the, the disagreement didn't, did not heal despite Weizmann's efforts as a, outlined in Weizmann's autobiography. The organization was dissolved after the Balfour Declaration in 1917. When Herzl was reinterred in Jerusalem, Zhang Wu spoke at the ceremony in London to mark the occasion. According to Zev Jabotinsky, another famous early Zionist, Zhang Wu told him in 1916 that if you wish to give a country to a people without a country, it is utter foolishness to allow it to be the country of two peoples. It cause trouble. The Jews will suffer and so will their neighbors. One of the two, a different place must be found for either the Jews or their neighbors. So here we have Zangwill's thoughts and the thoughts of those who were not in favor of a Jewish state, of which there were many, particularly the established Jewish families had fought for their position in society and were worried that this would throw doubts upon their loyalty to Britain. I have not dealt with <coughs> Zangwill's opinions and thoughts on the ascendancy of English over Yiddish as the lingua franca, socialism, emerging trade unions, and the rights of workers and the rights of women, the arrival of reform, and the establishment of the Federation of Synagogues, all controversial and current issues of the time, all mentioned in the book. The book includes so many ideas and situations, but above all, it is a vivid description of the Anglo-Jewish community of the time through an affectionate, humorous and sympathetic portrayal of many characters, their lives, loves, hopes, ambitions, and disappointments. So Zhang Wu takes us from the East End to the West End, from those who stroll in Whitechapel to those who stroll along the Strand. It reflects Zangwill's own journey of one who has emerged from the ghetto and those who have yet to make that journey. Esther, of course, is embarking on this journey in more ways than one. Maybe Esther is Zangwill. She has the literary talents. Was this a disguise for his support of women's suffrage and rights? He was a well-known literary figure until his death in 1926 and as mentioned, was a very active Zionist. He featured on the cover of Time magazine. I think that's still there, hold on. Yeah. Right, you can see that, September 17th, 1923. And his papers are deposited in the Central Zionist Archive in Jerusalem. He's buried in Golders Green Cemetery. The plaque, so I'll, I'll show you that. The, pl the plaque outside his house in East Preston, which is near Midhurst in Sussex, reads as follows. Edith Ayrton and Zang Israel Zangwill lived here from 1906, 
writers and campaigners for women's suffrage, a Jewish homeland and world peace. There are not once one quote I would like to give you. A man likes his wife to be just clever enough to appreciate his cleverness and just stupid enough to admire it. An unexpected remark for a supporter of women's rights and suffrage. This is a masterpiece of a description of a community that's in transition. Those who are part of it, those wishing to leave and those who have left. He has described the community as a whole, but has also made it personal by including the love story between <laughs> Esther and Raphael, which merges East and West. And that is what he wanted, a world of equals and humanity with all being given opportunity. He has an immense knowledge of many subjects and he uses a variety of characters and backgrounds. Whichever book of his you choose to read, you will always find out something you didn't know before. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope it wasn't too disturbed. No. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Thanks, Really interesting. It wasn't uh, wasn't disturbed at all. So, really? so not only was it a very good talk, but it was also an unfrozen talk. So, uh, <laughs> you know, an unfrozen talk. Victory, oh, thank you, David. <laughs> oh, Mel uh, and Karen. She talked. Karen was my share screen teacher, and I didn't live up to her teaching ability. I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> Karen has a question. How do uh, Karen, can, well, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. No, I was clapping you with the. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> okay, thank oh, you. It was fantastic, Priscilla. Okay. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, has anybody ahead, got? Uh, not that I'm oh, professed to be able to. Really, do. I, I don't see any. I don't. Can I, I don't just see any help. My brother's here from Israel. Is my brother? Here? Yes, my brother's here from Israel. He's not showing himself. Okay. <laughs> There are lots of right. complimentary comments on the chat, Priscilla, but no, yeah, right. no comment. No testing, no testing questions. Seems you've done pretty well. Audrey, <laughs> yeah. Yes, go uh, ahead. Oh, good, good evening. Um, this is Audrey Nella broadcasting from Bournemouth. Yeah. So please go Hello. ahead. Um, Priscilla, I'd just like to tell you how much I enjoyed your talk. Um, the school I went to, you had in their library I can't hear in their library at the school library, there were two books uh, that was Children of the Ghetto and Dreamers of the Ghetto which are both yeah. uh, yes um, the Dreamers of the Prosecution case I learned a lot from those yeah, and I just ask everybody to mute. Mute. Would you mind muting yourself? Hang on, Mr. Stella, just a sec. Would you mind everybody mind what? muting yourselves, please? I can't hear. I can't hear what Anna's saying. That's I can't right, hear what Anna's saying. We're getting some uh, interference. So if you, thank you. Right. Okay. So oh, yeah. Stella, yeah. Okay. And also, um, I bought um, the uh, the King of Schnorros. Yeah. Yes. So, I read that book immensely. It's quite a comic uh, story, isn't it? Yeah, well, the, the, those I think those are the three. Those are the three most well-known ones. The Children of the Ghetto, Dreamers of the Ghetto, is very interesting because it it deals with various uh, um, personalities. So and it's the chapters are self-contained. So okay, Shabbatai. There's a story about Shabbatai Svi. And from Smyrna and the Spinoza from Amsterdam and there's actually one particular story in there which um, Zhang will learn from Dr Solomon Schechter and those who are familiar with the Cairo Geniza and Schechter's work with the Geniza he, he got a story from uh, Dr Schechter which he put into Dreamers of the Ghetto. King of the Schno King of Schnorras I didn't actually um, investigate too much but that is is one of his most well-known ones. It's very difficult to explain the concept of Schnorra to a Gentile. I hope there's no Gentiles on this Zoom, but I, it's very difficult to explain a Gentile. To a Gentile. <laughs> okay. Um, no, it's not necessarily. No, Michael's shouting beggars. I don't think they are beggars. Can I just again ask, please, please mute yourselves unless you're speaking because we're getting some interference. Which kind of breaks up the narrative. Um, Priscilla, are you are you done? Did, some, you did Mireille you? want to say something? I'm finished with the talk. Unless no. someone wants Thank to ask you. Something. Let's ask. Did you want to say anything, Mireille? Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Merci bien. Um, I wonder what what the um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I wondered what uh, the uh, yes. the blue plaque, uh, the East Preston, is it Preston in Lancashire? East no, no, Preston. no, 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 no. It's East it's... Preston near Midhurst in Sussex, in Sus West Sussex. In... Oh, Mid they lived out oh, in the country Midhurst. from 1906 onwards. Oh, okay. Midhurst, yeah. near Midhurst in Sussex. Thank you. Uh, okay, I can... Uh, uh, it's interesting, I always find it quite interesting that, um, as, as Priscilla said at the beginning, um, that Zangwill, who was the uh, for Jewish rights, it's true, but he didn't live, he didn't live what we would consider, I think, as a traditional Jewish life. You know, his wife, Edith, wasn't Jewish. Um, yet translations of some of the prayers for the Yamin Noraim are permitted in the Routledge Machsel, which is the, or was the stand maximum for the United Synagogue. Um, it's amazing. I'm not they'd get away with that in the 21st century. With the, the easy seems to have got away with it in the 19th, early 20th century. I can also commend uh, the 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 stories. Uh, children, it's it's a shame. I think people don't read Sample very much, um, and certainly Children of the Ghetto is a brilliant, brilliant book. And the short stories uh, of, of ghetto comedies and ghetto tragedies are really, really very good as well. Um, so, you know, one can recommend those. And that those of you who, who may have children or grandchildren who have worn the yellow tie, or indeed may have worn the yellow tie yes. themselves, as, as a my younger house son. member of, of Zangwill House at JFS, you always have a moral responsibility to uh, immediately get onto Amazon and uh, get something by Zangwill. David, there. Is, there okay. a, is, there a, um, is David, is there a significance to the yellow? Is there a reason why it's yellow? Because that I couldn't not find out. I, not that I know okay. of, no. No, because, okay. because, he, because red, yellow, red, yellow, red, green and blue are taken by other people. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't. Um, okay, so um, if there are no further comments, or maybe there are well, some further I have comments. Got, I've got a little comment. Hey, Annie, Madeline's got a little comment. Well, it's yes. just, a little, just to see, I've got a, a lovely old copy of Children of the Ghetto and Grandchildren of the Ghetto, which my father gave me. It's 1909. So if you're have interested you? to see it at any time. Have you oh, read well it? well done. It's earlier than mine. It's, it's early, mine's 1925. Oh, Yes. yes. It, have it, you read it? Well done. Lovely. It, it's you, such a lovely copy. I'm scared have you to read it? read it. I'll have to get a paperback or something. Have you read it? I haven't read it. <laughs> into it because it's such a lovely copy. I'm scared to spoil it. So I'll have to nice get to a paperback. Read, yes. If you read it too closely, the, the letters start to disappear. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If there are no further comments, I just want to say um, that Old Morris has got a comment. Yep. Yeah. Um... Just for a moment. Uh, yes, I, I, I read The Children of the Ghetto some time ago. I was brought up in the East End and I could identify every single street and person in The, in the Children of the Ghetto, even so, so long after it was written. Um, Jenny, who wasn't brought up in the East End, thought it was an interesting story, but couldn't identify with anything. <laughs> so yes, I... I I read this and it was almost like a, a history of my, uh, my my childhood. Okay. And a, he talks about the great ghetto school banging its um, its 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 alarm to get the kids to go to school. And of course, that was you know the school he went. It was interesting, Zangle, because although he he worked in the ghetto, he didn't live in the ghetto. So he had one foot in and one foot out. So he he had quite a an interesting view of life in the in, in the East End. Okay, enough. Of, so um, it just remains for me then to say a very, very big, big, big thank you to Priscilla and to Morris for two really great presentations this evening. Thank you very much. Um, and those whose appetites needed to be wetted, I'm sure have been duly wetted. And um, it's thank you so much. We appreciate the, the effort and research that's gone into all of this. And um, as far as we're concerned, 
all of the effort has really been worthwhile. Not sure how you feel about it, but as far as we, as far as we're concerned, the, the effort has been really worthwhile. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank very much appreciate. And um, before we wind up, I just like to uh, speaking of wetting your appetites. Um, next, we have two further presentations. Irene is going to talk about a book called Out of the Depths, which is the memoir or biography of Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, who was a remarkable man, one of the great men of our, of our time, who was a former prime minister, prime minister, former chief rabbi, Ashkenazi chief, mm -hmm. chief rabbi of Israel in the 1990s and in 2000s, and is a, is a, is a great man. I mean, that's one of the strings of his bow. He's a great man in many ways, and that's one of them. So Irene's going to talk to us about that. And we're also going to be introduced to a book of, a great book of short stories called Hasidic Tell, and that's all for next week. So thank you for your kind attention and attendance this evening. Thank you once again to Priscilla and Morris, and we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Same time. Thank you. 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 Thank